Hola, y'all. Happy Wednesday. Trying to remember to get out here earlier on Wednesdays because we have church and I'm trying my best not to walk in the dark. And that way you can see my face. Moving a lot better. I still take a couple breaks, at least one break a day and lay on a heating pad and do some muscle electrode machine thing just to help me out. But I'm feeling better. Maybe tomorrow I won't even mention it. <laughs> I'm hurting right now because I was sitting down for a minute doing some work, but it feels good to walk. I want to jump into it today. Um, and I guess the question that I would pose to you and also to myself would be, can you be trusted? Can you be trusted? I was reading today in 1 Samuel. So 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 27 and 28. And this is a very well-known Bible story about Hannah and Samuel. And the scripture says, For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. And I just, I don't know, I think I've been a little bit overly emotional the last couple days. There's been a lot of things in my life. And um, I was reading the scripture. I actually read the end of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Desiree, Ruth, the end of Ruth. And it's where Naomi, Ruth and Naomi, it's the good ending of their story. And the grandmother was actually nursing the baby um, that came from her daughter-in-law. And so I just read the end of that. And then I just went straight on into 1 Samuel. And I started reading about another baby. And this time it was Samuel. And you know the story. If not, I'm going to give like this, the quickest rundown of this. Hannah was married to a man, a good man who had two wives. Okay. Hannah could not have any kids. She did not have any children. She was barren. But the other wife had a lot of children. And we learned through the story that the other wife used this against Hannah to make her miserable. Like she antagonized her and bragged about it and just made Hannah feel worse. We know that Hannah's husband loved her very much and gave her special treatment because he saw how sad she was that they couldn't, she could not have a child. And so, he would always give her a little extra of things because she was lacking. I mean, she didn't have what the other wife had. So, they go up every year to do the yearly sacrifice. And they're going all together as a family. And this other wife is once again, like, making Hannah grieve. She is being mean to her. And um, Hannah's not even able to eat. She's so upset. And she finds herself in the temple crying and praying before God, but she's not saying anything. She's just praying. Her lips are moving, but she doesn't say it out loud. And the priest, Eli, sees her and he thinks that she's drunk because he can't hear what she's saying. And she's just, she looks like she's just on his drunken stupor in the temple. And he basically says that. And she says, no, <clears throat> my heart is so heavy. I haven't had anything to drink I am just, I have given my petition to the Lord. I have asked of him something. And Eli, not know, not really knowing this is about to change his life as well, kind of says, well, whatever it is that you've requested, may God, may the God of Israel, whatever, give it to you. And that's it. And Hannah gets up and she just accepts that word. She just accepts it. And it says she wasn't sad anymore. Because the man of God said, okay, well, whatever you asked him for, he's going to do it. And she just gets up and it says that she goes back home and her and her husband, of course, conceive. But while she was praying, she said, God, if you will just give me a child, I will give him back to you. I will dedicate him to you. I'll give him back. If you'll just give me a child, I'll give him back to you. And we know that that's what happens. And so the next year... She, her and her husband are supposed to come back and do the yearly sacrifice. And she tells him, I'm not going to go back anymore until it's time to give him up. So when he is weaned, 
then I'm going to take him there and I'm going to leave him because I promised him to the Lord. And I looked it up and weaning can happen anywhere from two to five years old. So at the oldest, when Samuel is taken, he is a five-year-old little boy. And at the youngest, he's probably two or three. And my heart broke this morning as I was reading this. And I turned to my husband and I said, and I just told him really quick, I was like, you know, Hannah went back and gave, we all know Hannah gave Samuel back to the Lord, but he was just weaned. So he's between two and three and five years old. And I just asked my husband, I said, could you do that? And he said, no. And I'm sitting in the chair and I'm thinking, could you do that, Jesse? And I am not trying to be ugly or disrespectful, but I was sitting in my chair thinking to myself, put yourself in her shoes. Could you do that? And I don't know. And that makes me really sad. That's why I'm asking, can you be trusted? Hannah had made a request and she promised God something and she was trustworthy. And I think so often we hear these stories and we don't really think about the gravity of it. I literally tried to put myself back when I had my first baby, my oldest, Brady, who just turned 15. I tried to put myself back 15 years ago. When he was born, you couldn't pry him out of my hands. I would not accept help. I didn't want anybody, like I was bad. Sometimes I didn't want anyone holding him, like he was mine. And I don't know if it's because we had a little trouble at birth or he's my first or what. I was just so, my husband was too. We were just so <laughs> overly protective of him. And my heart felt like it was tethered to his. Like I just could not be away from him. I couldn't get a break from him. I didn't want him to go anywhere overnight. Like. It was, I mean, I'm very particular about my children. I still am. But I try to put myself in that situation and him growing up to be three, four, five years old and taking him, keeping my promise and taking him to the church and dropping him off knowing that I'm not going to see him again except once a year when I come to make the sacrifice. That I'm giving over a piece of myself to God because I told him I would. And I, and I just, I know I'm a person, I'm human. And I was thinking, did Samuel even understand that his parents didn't abandon him? I can't imagine my child being dropped off with an unknown man and me leaving. So I know that when we hear these stories, we just accept them as they are. But I try to think about what it was really like. And I just think there were a lot of tears on the day that little bitty Samuel was dropped off. It makes me cry right now thinking about it because I know that Hannah was honorable and that she kept her word. But you cannot tell me that that mother who had waited so long and prayed so hard for that little boy. You cannot tell me that when she turned around and walked away and left this little boy standing there that she didn't worry about his safety, that she didn't miss him in the middle of the night, that she didn't miss all the milestones. You cannot tell me that her mother heart did not break at some level. And I think about Samuel, the boy. I think God has to come in and step in at some level for both of them because I think about children now who are abandoned and who are left and who don't have both parents growing up or who don't have their parents at all. Even children who have been adopted and they don't know their biological parents and stuff. And I think about the effects that it has on them. And I know that he was dedicated to the Lord. I get that. And I know that God took care of him and he was special. I get that. But I also know that we are all born in the flesh. And I know that and believe that the miraculous part of Hannah and Samuel is that they were human and yet they still did what God asked. Here's my thoughts. Can I be trusted with God's blessings 
or am I selfish and don't keep my word? We make a lot of promises to God when we are in need and when we're desperate. And most promises are sacrificial in nature. But when it comes time to keep our word, we look at the cost and we change our mind. The cost for Hannah was great. Give me back the gift that I gave you. The thing that lights up your life. It was her only child, her miracle child, her promised child. I wrote down for obedience, for obeying God and keeping her word. God gave Hannah three more sons and two daughters after that. But she did not know when she gave him up that that was coming. Imagine the bravery, the integrity, the trustworthiness. Hannah gave up her only baby to keep her word, not knowing that God would ever give her another one. He did not promise her another baby, and that one was a miracle. So she didn't give the baby up knowing God's going to bless me for it. She gave it up out of obedience with no promise of reward. She could have kept her one child, Samuel, and been selfish and not kept her promise. But instead, she gave him to God and gained five more. God blessed her five times more. And she did see Samuel. Every year, she made him a little coat and she would bring it to him. And I can just imagine, I can just imagine every year when she comes up to see Samuel. Look, I got you a new coat. Look, mommy made you a new coat and to spend a few days with him. She only got a few days of every one of those years to see him for a week when he was five, a week when he's six, a week when he's seven. And to make that as close, close for him because he's special to her. And to once again, feel the rip and the grip of your heart when you have to walk away. Imagine all the siblings and the growing up that he didn't get to do with his brothers and his sisters. I don't want to be stingy with God's blessings and make empty promises to God that I don't keep. And I know this story might sound weird, but I'm honoring Hannah today because I'm telling you transparently that I would hope if I promised God something that I could do it no matter what. I would hope that no matter how bad it hurt, that I could keep my word to God. I hope that I could. I believe that I could. But I don't know how well I would cope with it. In Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 4 through 5, it says, When you make a vow to God, don't delay in fulfilling it. God doesn't delight in fools. <laughs> That's the words. But pay what you vow. It is better to not make a promise than to make one and not keep it. And that's the question I'm asking. Can you be trusted? We make a lot of promises today. We tell them, God, I'll never do it. If you get me out of this situation, I'll never do it again. God, if you help me with this addiction, I'll never do it again. God, if you just get me out of this danger, I'll never come back to this place again. God, this, God, that. When we're desperate, all of a sudden, all these promises start flying out of our mouths. We're bargaining with him and we're trying to buy his protection and his safety and his blessing. And we're telling him, if you'll do this, I'll do this. And in the heat of the moment, sure, maybe we mean it. Maybe we do, because in the heat of the moment, everybody means it, right? But then later, when it comes time to fulfill what we said, God, I said I wouldn't hang out with them anymore. God, I said I would break up with him. I would break up with her because I realize it's not your will. God, I said I would quit this job. God, I said I would apply for this job. God, I said I would forgive. God, I said I'd lay the cigarettes down. God, I said I would stop watching pornography. God, I said this. God, I said that. If you would just help me, if you would just do this, if you'll bless me, if you'll keep me. And then when it comes time to do the sacrificing, we don't do it. And I wrote something on kingdom here. I think it's because we are so comfortable with God that we treat things very lightly. 
that should be treated with a lot more reverence. See, in Hannah's day, they didn't have the Spirit of God living inside of them. They had to travel to a temple. They had to go through offerings and priests to do, to commune with God. They were held in big reverence and fear of the Lord. They were scared of Him, and they didn't have that one-on-one -on -one personal relationship with Him. They knew Him, and they feared Him. But today, we have Him one-on-one -on -one living inside of us. And sometimes when God becomes that comfortable with us, we become that comfortable with him. We lose some of our fear and our reverence and our respect. And then it's easy to just say things to him and not to fulfill them. I want to be trustworthy. And I want to be careful of what I tell the Lord that I'm going to do. So I don't know what you vowed to God. I don't know what you told him you would quit. I don't know what you told him you would do. But I am appealing to you today that if you've made a vow to God, if you've made a promise to him, that it is in your best interest to keep it. No matter what it is, if it was worth uttering and he came through for you, Keep your promise. You have to be trustworthy. Can he trust you to keep your word? Because God is a word-keeping God. Because he doesn't fail us. And I think we should be caught. You know, there's there should be some caution when we start promising things. Because if we commit to it and we ask for it, we need to be trustworthy of it. And sure, I think there's blessings in it. There is blessings in it. But that's not the reason that we do it. And there may be blessings that we will never see. That maybe there was some prevention that we'll never see. Maybe something didn't happen to us that we'll never know about. Because we were obedient. And we kept our word. See you tomorrow.